I'm told this thing moves, which is good, because if I stand there the whole time, my knees will lock up, I'll faint, and none of you are going to want to listen to that part. So I'll move around. Uh, just for those of you who don't know who I am uh, or don't know a whole lot about me, one of the things that I, I still surprise people with is when I tell them that in a former life, I taught computer science. And I taught computer science at university level. So I actually have a PhD in computer science and oddly enough, adult education. Therefore, I'm here talking about mulches. <laughs> it's perfect. Let's see, it no work. It's possible the battery has died here. So we'll try this. There we go. So I'm just gonna have to pop over there and do that once in a while. So this is our farm. Uh, our neighbors who have many hundreds of acres of farm believe that we are a hobby farm. Uh, but I can tell you that 15 acres is plenty to get in trouble with. It's a 15 acre farm. We have about five acres of vegetables. Uh, and you'll notice if you look at the top center, uh, we have one movable high tunnel there. We have another movable high tunnel at the bottom left. The right hand side is the majority of our vegetable production. We run a seven uh, year rotation there, although that's now changing. And then we have some pasture area for poultry. So we have turkeys, we have meat chickens, we have laying hens. So that kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that we do. Uh, we have been running this farm since 2005. We moved to the location in 2004. Uh, over the winter we went through a business planning series and started, thank you, started our farm in 2005 and uh, we have been certified organic since 2007, which is pretty good, I think. Uh, we've been doing a CSA since 2005, and 2020 will be the first year since then that we will not be doing a CSA. We're actually making some changes. Uh, we will still be growing vegetables, raising the poultry, but we're going to be distributing in different ways and to different locations. Uh, we try to focus on local sales. That's one of our key things. Hey, it worked. So what I'm going to do, what I want to lay a few ground rules here, is that there have been some great sessions on cultivation and other ways of controlling weeds. So it would be tempting for me to start talking about some of our cultivation methods. I will show a little bit of it, and it might be tempting for you to ask questions, but I may defer on those until the end and stick with the mulch stuff, all right? But in any event, what I want you all to know is what the special considerations for our farm are, because your farms are all different than mine. Some of the things that I do will not work for you, period, exclamation point, it won't. But some of the ideas could be adapted to fit your farm. So as long as we realize that, we're cool. Uh, a couple of the things you might want to know, you notice the bottom right, most of us did have some trouble with a little excess water in the last couple of years, just a wee bit. Uh, at our farm, we set all-time recorded records for snowfall last year and all-time records for just all sorts of precipitation for the year period. I mean, we were, it, I would like a year, I, people are saying I want an average year, I want a year where we don't set records of any kind. Okay, it can be a little bit more than normal or a little less than normal, just don't set records, we've had enough of that. Uh, the other thing, if we notice the two young ladies up there, two of our workers this past summer, we have had a lot of gnats on the farm. And before you say, well, what does this have to do with mulch? Some of our mulching decisions have to do with what kind of things we have to do with our labor. And if you have to send people that you like, okay, even if it's people you don't like, if you have to send them out there and they have to wear the kinds of clothing they're wearing on a day where the temperature was in the low 90s, then maybe you need to adjust how you do things so you don't have to send people out there looking like that in temperatures like that. All right, so it's, it's an important enough thing that we have to actually think about it. Uh, we have loam soils, we have Oren loam and Tripola loam. If you don't know what your soil types are, I encourage you to find out because that can make some differences for you. Uh, we have a, what people call a high water table on our farm. We're generally flat. Our soils don't have many rocks, all right? But of course, when it rains too much, the water has nowhere to go. So we become a giant lake, all right? Uh, things have been getting wetter, and so that means when it comes to cultivation, our windows for cultivation are that big. You know, moments. If you're not out there in time, your window's done, 
never mind the weeds are going to grow. And I will actually show you a couple pictures with weeds, which is a scary thing for me because this is my farm and I want you to think well of me. But we had weeds, all right? Uh, labor availability is something. We grow a lot of crops. Uh, last year we grew about 40 different kinds of crops. This year we're going to simplify things to 25. Isn't that nuts when you say I'm simplifying to 25 different kinds of crops? And you're going, oh, thank goodness. You know, it's kind of a crazy thing. And then, of course, I'm supposed to say this because I'm the quote unquote expert in front of you. When you're cultivating and dealing with weeds, catch them at the thread stage. Y'all got that, right? Okay, I've said it. Now let's move on. All right. So because it's nearly impossible to get out there and do the cultivation on a regular basis, you have some strategies. One of those strategies is to say, let's limit where the cultivation is going to happen to those things that I'm particularly good at cultivating, to those things that don't lend themselves to other weed control methods. All right? So that's what I'm trying to do here so that when I have that short window, I can actually get in there and do something about it. So at the top, you'll see some of the ones that we tend to cultivate. Among them are onions, the brassica could be one of them. Things like lettuces that are short season, to me seems to make no sense to expend time putting a long-term mulch down for something that's gonna get pulled out. And if I'm not willing to replant into the same holes, it doesn't make sense for me to use a mulch there. So cultivation, yeah, I think it makes sense in those. But then we've got all these other different processes we could use for mulching. And you'll notice one of them, the cover crop residue is mulch. I have nothing listed there because we haven't actually done that. But I'm interested to do that. So I wanted to make sure I included that on there. Uh, we'll go through each of these a little bit, but at least you kind of see what they are. But I want you to pay attention to the bottom. On the bottom, we're talking about the things you should think about when you're thinking about what you're going to do for mulch or cultivation. Number one is crop spacing. And I'm not just talking about between row spacing, I'm talking about in row spacing. If you've got certain kinds of crop spacing, it's going to lend yourself to a different kind of mulch or a different cultivation approach. So you need to be aware of that. This is not haphazard spacing. You don't just say, I threw some plants in, now what am I going to mulch it with or what am I going to do for cultivation? This is a planned spacing. Uh, we want to know about the primary growth period. So if it's a warm season crop, let's say we're talking about our farm and we're talking about green beans. If I'm planting green beans, we typically put our biggest crop in about May 20 as long as it's not too wet. Never mind, so June 20. In any event, May 20. And so you're talking about the biggest growth period for the beans are going to be happening in about two and a half weeks to three weeks after that. So you're looking at that's when you want the best, quickest growth, which means you don't want to do cultivation or mulches that are going to inhibit that growth period. You get what I'm saying? And the reason I say that is some of your mulches cool the soil some of your mulches will warm the soil. And if you're cooling the soil during that primary growth period, then your plants are gonna slow down, which is exactly what you didn't want, right? So consider that as you're putting these things on there, if you're thinking about it. Your preferred, preferred soil conditions, we'll talk about that later. And then weed zones. You all have all done this enough that you understand the weed zones, you just might not have the same labels I have for them, okay? You've got the in-between plants or the in-row stuff that you often have very little choice but to bend down and pull a weed because it's right next to it. You've got the stuff that is between row, which is often real easy to do with cultivation methods. It's where your wheel track is for your tractor or whatever. And then you've got the mulch or bed edges. Okay. If you do raised beds, you've got that little bit of a terrace. That takes some special cultivation or handling because you don't want to erode the terrace away. If you've got particular mulch, if you've got plastic or you've got paper mulch, those edges can become great fun too because when you decide to invest in plastic or paper mulch, when they sell it to you, they tell you how great it is and how little weeding you're going to do. And then when you put it in, you begin realizing there's a new weed zone that becomes difficult. And that's the one right at the edge where that mulch ends. Okay, so you have to consider that when you're doing this. Oh, yeah, these are two more mulches. <laughs> they are very effective. Don't use them. All right, so here's our toolbox on the farm. 
You'll notice on the top left, we've got a 45 horsepower tractor with a regular three point hitch. And we've got the BCS tractor, the walk behind tractor on our farm. So it kind of gives you some idea of what we have so you can make adjustments to what you're thinking as I'm talking. Uh, the top right, that's an old S time cultivator and it used to be I believe 16 foot long we bought this really cheap at an auction as a used tool and we cut it in half and we made two of these and so this one is set up so that the tines are immediately behind the tires so when I want to clean out the tire tracks the weeds have gotten a little big I can pull this thing behind and I can clean that clean that area out we've got another one where you can have a second one in the middle and so if you got two rows you could run in in between with that uh, it works great unless you get too much of the tall grasses or whatever and then it's going to drag the trash behind you. It's going to get all wrapped around and you're going to pull it and then you're going to start beating up all the plants that you're pulling, trying to save. So that's just something to consider. The bottom left would be one of the best investments of our farm. That thing is a Williams toolbar. It's a flex tine weeder. It also has uh, squash knives and a few other things to it. It's got the guide wheels so you can make sure you can set the depth. Uh, we use that tool for some of our cultivation for things like onions. So you wonder why I'm not using mulch for onions? It's because I have this lovely tool that actually does what I need it to do and I can use it in that little tight window and get enough done. Okay? Doesn't mean that this last year was perfect. It means I got enough done. We had a good crop. Yay for us. All right? And then on the bottom right, that is a rotary harrow. And I mentioned this one not because it's a mulch, but because what it does is it doesn't bring up more weed seeds from the lower part of the bank. Rotary harrows move like this. They're mixers. They don't roll over the top. All right. So what it's doing is it's not necessarily inverting your soil. So if you're worried about bringing up more seeds from down low, well, a, rot a rototiller is going to do that for you and you're going to keep replenishing the top seed bank so they will germinate. If you want to make a, steel, a stale seed bed, great. If you would rather not, not so great. So this tool is pretty good for that. And if you have problems with things like uh, Canadian thistle, I love this thing because it kind of grabs the plant instead of cutting it, kind of grabs it and yanks it out and pulls it to the top of the soil and they desiccate. And I love watching them die. Okay. I sound so bloody when I do that, but it's, it's true. Canadian thistle, die. Okay. Getting to the mulch thing, on the top left is a mulch layer, all right? And if you look at that right up there, this is something I don't use, but we'll talk about that in a bit. But when you get a mulch layer, you can have a bar across the top and you can cause it to lay drip tape underneath the mulch as you're laying it, all right? The way this thing works is you've got two discs here, you've got two discs back there, and you've got wheels here and here. So what happens is these first two discs are going to throw dirt away and make two trenches for you. And then you have your roll of material here and they roll underneath these two wheels. So they press them down into the trench and then the two discs in the back throw that dirt back onto where the paper or the plastic is. This is great. You need probably two people to use it because you want one person who's holding onto the plastic or somehow securing it when you take off and then they can yell at you when you're messing something up. Okay, but they don't have to do a whole lot. It can be pretty much anybody. Uh, but this thing works great. Uh, it cuts the labor down for laying certain kinds of rolled mulches immensely, even if you need two people there. The time, uh, I have seen people who will unroll stuff and do the digging with a shovel thing and covering the edges, and there's no way at this point in my career I'm going to do that. It's, it's just not interesting to me, and it, it's probably not the best way to use your labor. And if you're the farmer and you're the most skilled one there, spending a lot of time with a shovel digging little trenches and burying edges of mulch may not be the best use of your time anyway. So if you can find a way, this thing is pro I was told when I called the uh, mechanical transplanter people, this is an old mechanical transplanter model. I got this thing for a couple hundred dollars. It needed a little bit of fixing. It does again. But the thing is, is it was easy to figure out. When I called Mechanical Transplanter, I told them I had this thing. It was a Model 100, and they said, oh. And they told me what it was, and I said, no, that doesn't match the description. And they paused for a second and said, oh, you have the old Mechanical Transplanter model. So I've got one of the earliest ones here. 
but it didn't cost me much. It works fine, uh, and it saves a lot of time. You all know the wheel hoe probably. I love the wheel hoe, and I almost don't like the wheel hoe some days, but you know, it's a good exercise. This is the other new tool. It's called a cyclone rake, uh, and this represents a return to something we used to do. When we first started doing this growing thing, and we were very small scale, we had a lawnmower, we had a little grass catcher, we'd catch grass and we'd throw it down for mulch. But you can guess, if you've just got these little bags behind it, you've, if you've ever seen the lawnmowers people have with the bags, it doesn't take long for them to fill up, and then they're really inconvenient to drag and dump where you want them to go. So that stopped fairly early because it was too labor intensive. Well, we convinced ourselves to try that thing. Uh, I think Tammy might agree it was a good move. Um, it still requires some labor, but this actually cut a lot of the labor we used to have to do this work. So those are the tools that we have on our farm. They may or may not match yours. So what mulch can do? Number one, weed control. Yay, all right? But here's some other things. Remember that you can change your soil temperature. One of our earliest mistakes with mulch was putting the grass mulch. Remember, we used to collect that all the time and take times doing it. We put grass mulch down on our peppers. It kept the weeds down. Fantastic. The peppers didn't grow worth anything until the temperatures really got a lot higher because they were not getting any solar gain from the soil collecting the sun. All right, so we actually stunted our peppers by mulching them too soon with grass mulch, which is really, really good at insulating the surface and keeping it cool. All right, so that was a bad move. Uh, we reduced soil splash. So all of you have heard by now, I think, that you want to prevent soil from splashing on the lower leaves of your tomatoes, for example, right? Because that's a good vector for diseases getting on the tomato leaves. All right? So among others, that's true. But the other thing is, is if you're doing a CSA, farmer's market, or if you're trying to sell bulk, they don't want dirty product. And I don't like spending lots of time washing. And if you do a good job mulching, you spend less time cleaning. That's a win. I, I like to grow stuff. I like to be outside. I like to see flowers. I like insects. I really don't like spending time with my hands in cold water washing things. That's not what I like. Uh, so we tried to do things to prevent that. Uh, soil moisture is one. We reduce erosion. There's a couple more down here. If you read all the various things that talk about mulches, they'll list these things. And sometimes you, you can sense a lack of conviction when they say it. One of those is the reduced compaction thing. They'll say, oh, it reduces compaction. Well, I finally figured out why people put that there. Uh, think about this. Let's say you put plastic mulch down. Are you going to walk on that? <laughs> yeah, but you're not going to walk on it, right? That's the point, is by mulching it, you generally don't traffic it. That's the main reason for it being on there. And I'm kind of like, oh, that's nice. There was another one that talked about the fact that it deals with the soil moisture and consistency. And the reason one of those sites mentioned that is because you tend to use drip irrigation with various mulches. Okay, so this is a case where it's the irrigation, not necessarily the mulch that's making the difference. You see what I'm saying? But it's sometimes what will happen is your practices will change because you want to use this and that's a positive. But there's also truth when you have an organic mulch that it will actually prevent evaporation. And so there will be some soil moisture retention which maintains a more consistent moisture. All right, so some of these are interesting. Let's go to the next one. My favorite question. You're going you're gonna to have to take a guess which one I favor by the time we get done with this little section. Paper or plastic. So what we have here is we've got 200 foot rows with uh, what is that? That's the three foot wide paper from the Sunshine Paper Company, so it's called Weed Guard Plus, so you all know what it is. This is the heavyweight paper here. Uh, several years ago, we tried lighter white paper, and you can guess what happened. It blew apart pretty much within a week. We had a storm right after planting it. We put the plants in, they blew apart in the storm, and basically flapped up and down like any kind of mulch might do until it pulverized all our plants. So everything we planted, was gone. The good news is the Sunshine Paper Company said, oh no, and refunded our money. But that didn't necessarily bring our plants back. 
All right, so now if you're ever going to do paper mulch, you've got to go with the heavyweight product or you have to go with the creped product. The creped is kind of a crinkled paper. Don't, go with, don't even try to do the lightweight unless it's inside a building. Because in Iowa, you're going to be very disappointed with what happens if you go with anything other than heavyweight. All right? You'll also notice, if you look closely, the drip tape is on top of this. Okay, now part of the reason for that is if you saw that I had the earliest version of a mulch layer, if you looked closely, you notice it was just a regular piece of uh, a regular pipe that had that on there. I don't really have the attachments for this thing, nor are they available unless I custom make something to roll it underneath the paper. I don't really have that right now. But here's the great thing about it is paper happens to be permeable. And if it's permeable, that means the water will go through it anyway. So there's two reasons I like putting the drip tape on top. Number one is I can monitor what's happening with the drip tape. So if we start having problems, I can make repairs without having to say, well, it's either going to leak forever until it's all done or cutting a hole in the plastic and fixing it, right? The other one is this. Remember I talked about paper blowing apart in a storm? Well, part of that's because the mulch is not making good contact with the soil. What does paper do when you get it wet? settles down onto the surface of the soil. So, lay the paper, plant your plants, run the drip tape, it diffuses over the paper, it gets it a little bit softer and it pushes it down onto the ground. Now, if you get that storm, it should not do the flapping thing. All right, so I kind of like doing it this way for that reasons and for the repair reasons. And I'm too lazy to actually try and find a way to make one of those things that puts it underneath the mulch. Uh, no, that's not the case, but you understand what I'm saying, okay? So that's what it looks like on the farm when we put it down. There we go. And here's what it looks like a couple weeks later. The plants are in. These are winter squash and melons in this area. And you can see the plants here. They're all looking pretty good. And I was talking about weed zones, all right? So you've got in between row here, we fairly recently cultivated with bigger equipment. But if you look real close to the paper mulch, you got all these nice weeds growing there. So if you're gonna do any kind of mulch, you're gonna have that zone where things don't stay under control. You've gotta be prepared for that. It turns out that a wheel hoe works great. And one of the things you have to get over with the paper mulch is occasionally the wheel hoe is going to hang up on some of that paper that's rolled underneath and it's going to tear and it's going to come with you. Get over it. It's fine. Okay? You're going to tear a little bit of it. It's not doing you any good anyway because it's in that zone, right? As long as it doesn't come with you for the whole 200 feet and starts tearing wider, everything's fine. But that's a difference between paper mulch and plastic. If you happen to snag plastic, it isn't going to tear, is it? Not without a lot of help. So you can end up pulling a whole bunch of plastic behind you for a little while. Now, how do you fix this once you've started to stretch it out and pull it off? Okay, with the paper, it tears, and you're like, well, okay. So there's a little paper missing over here. Good enough. So that's one of the things we kind of like about it. There we go. Here's another picture with the paper mulch here. These are tomatoes, so we've got cages holding the tomatoes up. We've got the paper underneath, the drip tape on top. The nice thing about tomatoes and drip tape is if you're going to cage them, you can use the cage to hold, help hold the drip tape in place. So that's kind of nice too. Uh, and it looked pretty good. I was pretty happy with how that one looked. Oh, I missed something there. Uh, maybe I didn't. That looks fine. This is the part I wanted to point out. So the paper mulch meets organic standards unless you get a product that has been, has a product put into it to either add uh, some nutrients. Some of those products, they coat it with a product to try and give you a little fertilizer. A lot of times that is not National Organic Program compliant. So you have to be careful with that. But if it's just a standard paper, it meets, meets organic practices. So here is that paper mulch this year in 2019. And you remember I talked about how wet it is? the last couple of years. So you would expect that paper mulch would fall apart rapidly in a wet year, right? This is September. September, mid-September 2019. Look, the area around the plant, yeah, you can see where it's starting to go away, right? But you know what? By September, we all know wheat pressure is easier to deal with in September, right? In October, 
Here's the edges. You notice it's pulled out, but I've got full growth plants with full canopy. The paper's not going to damage them if it actually ends up pulling apart and starting to beat on things. So if I've got this much cover in September, I think we're okay. All right, let's do another one. Here's November. This is tomatoes in November. I would say that there's two things being shown here. One, I still have coverage. And two, it's breaking down enough that I'm not going to have to worry about it next spring. It'll be gone or gone enough. So it's doing the two things I want. It's, it's suppressing the weeds, and it's not adding the labor of removing the mulch material. Whatever's left will probably break down when I run that rotary harrow or whatever my cultivation equipment is to prepare. So it should be OK. I'm not going to read through all this. These are just interesting things. But I want you to, do, to know this. Paper mulch has been in use since the 1919 period. They used it in Hawaii for 90% of the pineapple crop. This is not new, and yet we treat it like it's a new thing. Okay, so it's been around, and it's been used, and it's been acceptable. Uh, but otherwise, consider it. So now, I'm on my soapbox. Why didn't we use plastic? How many folks in here do use plastic? Okay, good. And you use it for two reasons, I'm guessing. We control, and it's cheap, right? It's one of the most economical mulches out there. If you've got that, that layer, you're able to put it down. As long as you get that tight on the bed so that it's actually making that soil contact so it doesn't billow on you, it's pretty darn good stuff. It's easy to use with mechanical transplanters. You still have the same problems you do with paper for the edges or for the plant holes for weeding, right? I mean, Dale would agree with me on this, it's the same issues. Uh, but the point is, is the price per foot, okay, is probably what, two to three cents per foot, row foot, would you say? And the price per foot of the paper for purchase is around 15 to 17 cents per row foot. That is a huge, huge difference, okay? So this is why I want to do truth in advertising. Why don't I? use plastic because from a purely straight economical standpoint, it makes sense, doesn't it? Add on the cost of removal, okay, and a few of those other things, and maybe plastic gets up to about seven, eight cents per row foot. That's still half, or even less than half, 40%, okay? This is why I can't condone this, okay? People like us who do the hort crops and the small farms and diversified farms like to tell ourselves we're doing good things. We also like to say bad things about people who do things in ways we don't like. Well, you know what? I don't like this stuff. And so I decided that I will not be a part of it, even though my 15-acre farm is not going to make much of a dent in 3.2 million tons of agricultural mulch plastic being thrown away every single year in the world. That's a whole heck of a lot. Yes, and that was 10 years ago, and if you look at it, we've got a trend of movement. Okay, So I may not be making tons of difference with my small farm, but I will not be part of the problem. Some of the things that I wanted to do, though, is I had suspicions, and I didn't want to just say it's because I hate throwing plastic away. Okay, that's so trite and easy to do, right, to make that argument. Let me make some more that might be more personable to your farm. This one right here. There are now studies coming out. These are older, but there are more that have shown that invertebrates under plastic have been reduced. You're about soil health in here, aren't you? Soil invertebrates, you want to have healthy soil invertebrates. You're putting plastic on it and you're reducing them. You would like organic matter in your soil, wouldn't you? And yet if you use plastic, it tends to go down. And I think all of us can agree that something causes cancer. Myco mycotoxic fungi increasing underneath plastic might not be a good thing. Huh. Okay, how about these if you don't buy those? China has been one of the biggest growth period reasons for the growth here in amount of use. And they started doing some studies. It's a seven, eight-year study in China. Actually, there were five of them. 
And each of them said, well, let's see what's going on with the plastic use, all right? These are places that keep using plastic every year in the same area, so keep that in mind. They were finding that, of course, plastic degrades as it's out in the field. It's going to respond to the elements and it will break down. Even though you pull a bunch of it off when you dispose it at the end of the year, there are still polymers in the soil. And what they do after a period of time is they actually start to get there and change the soil and inhibit plant growth. This is counterproductive to what we want, right? We want our long-term success for growing. You also notice that the polymers have been shown to enter the food chain via the plants. So some of the breakdown polymers in plastic can be absorbed in the plants that we in turn eat. You have also heard recently about microplastics in the ocean, probably, et cetera, et cetera. I just can't do it. And there we go. So then the next question is, what about bio biodegradable plastic? That sounds like a good move, too, because you remove the, don't have to remove the plastic at the end. And the thing is, is they don't have studies to really tell you whether there's something that could go on with that or not. Just remember, this is the thing that I took away. The biological-based product in this kind of mulch is only 20% of everything it's made of. There are still plastics in it which means you're going to have polymers that can also enter the soil and enter the plants, all right? So I kind of backed off of that one. That doesn't mean I don't want to see movement in terms of other kinds of effective mulches that are less expensive, but we have paper mulch that's been used since 1919 that has shown it works. And as long as you don't put a lot of dyes and other chemicals in the paper, then maybe we don't have this, all right? So that's why I'm off my soapbox. Now let me talk about good stuff, all right? Here is grass mulch. You'll notice we grass mulched underneath our kale plants all the way across. Uh, the, the spacing on here, this is a two-foot spacing here between the plants. And we just basically collected several loads and we spread it out. The nice thing is we had ourselves some space here where we could get that trailer real close so we didn't have to go far. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, what about landscape fabric? Uh, that's a good question, and I know a lot of people use that. They burn the holes in, you know, where they want to reuse it. Um, first off, there are some plastics in those, so you're going to have some degradation over time, but it's, pro it's not probably going to be the same. I'll grant you that. Uh, the biggest issue I have with it, we've, we've only done this in a small section, and my problem with it is how do you pull the stuff up and store it and then put it back down again and get it cleaned? That's, that's the hardest part I have with it, is laying it. You can lay it with one of those mulch layers. We're talking about the fabric mulch. You can lay it with those. But how do you roll it back up so you can lay it with it again the next year? Because a lot of us don't necessarily want to keep that same soil covered through the winter that's going to promote the degradation of the material you want to reuse anyway. So it's a good question. And in fact, we've considered that some, but I typically get stopped at our scale on that pulling up, cleaning it up, and storing it, and using it again stage. Because I'm not going to spend time hand rolling and then hand unrolling the next year. If you're willing to do that, more power to you. Uh, but I can't. Uh, I'm, I'm no longer as strong as I used to be, I guess. But this is, this is still a valid question, too. Let's expand on what you were saying. The grass mulch, you have to mow an area, you have to collect the mulch, and then you have to get the mulch out of the container and spread it evenly. That's all human work, right? So once again, here I am whining about I don't want to pick up the, the, the mulch at the end of the year and roll it up properly. But here I am saying, oh yeah, grass mulch works great. Because, well, here's the good news. I had an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old who were helping spread the mulch, so I didn't have to do that. Um, so, you know, sometimes that works. Yes? Good question. How thick is the mulch that is shown in this picture with the kale, and when did we put that mulch on? Uh, in this case, this is a late planting of kale. So we put this in when the plants were probably about six to eight inches tall at that point. 
So we'd already gotten to the point where they'd absorbed some of that heat, they'd gotten some size to them, and then we put the mulch on, and the mulch probably ran, I'd say probably about six inches deep on an average. Again, this is not, I didn't have two scientists out there measuring, they just kind of spread and said that looks good. Uh, we were trying to make sure that if you walked on it, you did, if you scuffed your foot a little bit, you didn't easily expose soil. That might be a good way to describe it. Uh, if you do scuff your foot and you expose soil, it's not deep enough. Fair enough. Uh, but that's kind of what happened. So this has been, this has actually been down for a while, and it lasted all the way through the rest of the season for us, just that one application. Uh, the cool things about it is that the kale was so dang clean. When I harvested that kale and bundled it, it was great, except for one time. Anybody guess? The very first bundle right after the mulch, because of course we weren't always so careful about, oh, you know, throw the mulch around. It got into the plants and they were in the leaves. So you can imagine how annoying it was as we were cleaning, going, oh, pull this grass out, this grass out. Okay, that was annoying. But after that, I've never had cleaner kale than we had after we did this. So truth in advertising, the first time after spreading mulch, if you're a little bit lazy about where it goes, you're going to be picking grass out of the water when you're cleaning it. But it's fun. Here's another example with the grass mulch. Uh, we've got double row of green beans here. We've got a row of potatoes here that have been hilled recently. We've got more green beans there. This is something that's residue from when Tammy and I first started gardening, actually, is we would use our grass mulch from the lawn and we put it in with the green beans because, frankly, green beans were a pain to weed. And what do you do when you hand pick green beans? You're down in with the green beans, right? Well, if you've had wet years and soil is muddy, wouldn't it be nice to be on a spongy, nice grass? So we, we focus pretty much on this, on this stuff. And it works beautifully. It does not cause problems with uh, any kind of fungus issues as far as the green beans are concerned. Uh, it worked nicely for the double rows. We didn't have to do anything with between row. Uh, in here, we didn't have to really worry about that once it was mulched. The other nice thing is with our potatoes, there's always some big weeds. I think if you look back in here, there's another row of potatoes and you can see some taller stuff in there. There's always a few bigger weeds that pop up late that I don't get rogued before we decide to dig the potatoes. And those are a pain in the butt when you hit them with the digger and it clogs things up and now it's not so easy to dig your potatoes. Well, I've, I had an easy time with the ones we put the grass mulch on. It was really smooth. We didn't have a lot of problems. All of this was with the investment of labor up front. But I saved labor in the back. And when I talk about labor windows, we have workers who are usually school-based workers, shall I put it, students or faculty. So once we get to September, they're gone. I am the farmer. It is just me. So if I can change my labor window to the period when I have these workers and eliminate some of the labor on the back end or the front end, when I don't have the extra help, it fits my farm. And mulch often is one of those things that helps me fit that because I can actually use some of their effort when they're around. And you know what? How much training does it take to say, take grass out of this and spread it? There's nothing technical. Okay? It isn't even do a straight row or every six inches. None of that. It's just when you walk over it, if you don't scuff up bare soil, you've done a good job. My gosh, it's so easy to teach people to do this. So that's one of the reasons we actually said this was a good move for us. If your labor is different than ours, maybe it's not the right solution. All right? Oh, hey, November, grass mulch and paper mulch. We got paper mulch here in the tomato row, and then we threw grass mulch in between. And we did this for a, a very specific reason in this area. We kind of saw where the forecast was going in late August, and we said, oh no, not again. It's going to rain like it did last year. Okay, and we knew what happened in between rows. You couldn't get in to harvest things. It was too wet. So we said, good, we got lawn and it's been growing well because it's been raining lots go mow it and spread it and then you can actually walk in these paths without sinking up to your your knees when you fall head first into it okay and it actually worked very well 
Okay, so this was a way to actually make things accessible for us that might have become inaccessible. This does not work with plastic mulch, obviously, or paper mulch, because you don't want to walk on them, right? But this worked real well with the paths, and it solved a problem for us. Now, the sad thing is the problem, I wasn't able to give you an even better report because our tomatoes then proceeded to drown and stop producing. But, you know, at least for that glorious period, when it first started raining, when I could get in there and harvest, you know, it was great. All right, this is something I've already talked about. I wanted to mention, though, an idea that maybe if you want to do fall peas, I don't know how many people have tried fall peas in here. You have, what, have you had good success? Okay, try, yes. And we have tried as well. But if you want to try fall peas, one of the things you can look at is using grass mulch or straw mulch to reduce the temperature of the soil. So one of the things I have read about that I would like to try is putting some of this mulch down, keeping the soil cool, and then pull it aside and plant the seed in there. And then I think you might end up getting a fall pea crop potentially if you plant it in August, just to cool that soil down. All right, straw mulch is another one we've done. And what you see here are tomato plants and then rows of basil so it's basically a two, two, one. Two tomatoes, one basil, two tomatoes, one basil is what we're doing in this field. And we use straw mulch for all the tomatoes for all the regular reasons. Prevent soil splash, maintain moisture so that you don't have that big peak, shallow peak, shallow for moisture in the tomatoes that causes splitting, all those fun things. All right, so we did that for those reasons. And we've stopped using straw mulch for our tomatoes now. And it's another labor thing. I'm not saying straw mulch didn't work for us, but it's a labor thing. It turns out that our workers, oh, well, there's one of them. And it turns out our workers don't particularly like spreading straw mulch. I'm not particularly fond of it. And it seems like all the workers we get during the summer are not particularly fond of spreading straw mulch. I've yet to find one say, oh, yay, let's spread the straw mulch. For some reason, the grass mulch was, this is fun. Straw mulch is like, uh, OK, so straw mulch maybe isn't a winner. But the other problem is, is the period of time that we mulched the tomatoes was the exact period of time when everything else also needed to be done. All right? Too much, too much bottleneck on the labor. So what we started doing is we said, well, what can we do differently? How about if we put paper down, plant the tomatoes into the paper, okay? Then you can also cage at the same time because what we used to do is we'd plant them into the ground, let them get to a certain size and use the solar gain, right, to get a little bit bigger. It's hard to cage them at this point, so you don't. Well, now when you're ready to cage them, you have to cultivate first. And that's usually about the time you want to prune. And then you have to cage, and then you have to mulch, or you have to mulch and then cage, whichever way it goes. And with the amount of labor I had, what ended up happening is we were doing the old try and get the tomato that's already four foot tall into a cage. Okay? It wasn't all of them. It was usually that last section, you know, the last 40 plants. All the rest are in their cages, and there's still 40. And we're all like, no, not those. But you'd still try to do them, you know? So you'd have three people trying to tame the tomato and put it in the cage. Not really a good idea. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. So, yes, without straw and other kinds of straw, you're not always guaranteed to get something that doesn't have seed in it, right? It's going to happen. Um, and I know she mentioned the sterilization, and from my standard, for my size operation, it doesn't seem practicable. So I, I won't do that. But here's the thing. The, the oat straw plants that come up are so dang easy to kill, really easy to kill. It's such a small problem. So in the grand scheme, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I've been looking at you guys going, I think you're out there still. Um, but it seems like a small problem in the grand scheme of things. I'm willing to accept that. <laughs> Maybe I will move over here. All right, here I am. I can see you again. Uh, we do still use straw mulch for our garlic. 
all right? And there's multiple reasons for that. The biggest downside, of course, is it's an outside input. You have to purchase it in unless you've got the land to grow your own, right? Most of us in this room, I'm guessing, can't, we have, we're purchasing in, there's a few exceptions. So you think about that, which means if you're certified organic, there's a whole new nest of things you have to take care of, right? You've got to get various affidavits, David sign, and you have to be very careful about what you're putting on there. But you know, in the grand scheme of things, I'm, I'm pretty okay with that. It's not a big deal. Here's the one thing about straw mulch that does annoy me. You might recognize this if you've been using straw mulch. You notice these edges? You all know what I just did? I ran a cultivator through there, right? And straw mulch is really good at catching cultivators as you go by, pulling away from the base of the stems, you know, causing that edge zone to be a bit of a problem. Wheel hose don't do a whole lot better, but the one thing that I have found works is if you can find some sort of way to run a squash knife angled in. Okay, so the vertical comes down here and angles out towards your plants where that edge is. With straw mulch, you get underneath it, you cut the weeds just underneath the soil, and you end up cleaning that up pretty good. Obviously, this will not work for paper or plastic because you'll end up cutting those. You know, if you're trying to undermine, you're still going to get the stuff under the soil and, and catch it, right? But with the straw mulch, that works pretty well. I was lazy this day, and I tried running the cultivator without spinning things around, and that's what happened. So I spent time out there kicking the mulch back in place. But it does seem to work pretty well if you run underneath that, and it goes fairly well. Go machine, there we go. So what happens when it's wet? I promised not pretty pictures. Here's one, okay? So here's our broccoli, and, or no, actually this is cauliflower, Never mind. And then we've got our between row here and here, and then we've got our in row, which is paper mulch again. So the goal of keeping the grow zone of the plants is, is being successful right now, right? You notice that I've actually managed to get the area next to the edge of the paper is also clean. So I'm keeping that area clean. But things were so wet, I couldn't get out there and do anything else. It just, they just kept growing because weeds don't care. They don't look at your calendar. They don't look at the forecast. They just grow, right? So you deal with it. But this is just an example of if I have to, I have two main priorities. Priority one is the grow zone, the root zone for the plants where I want things to be. I want that clean first. And the second priority is please don't let these go to seed because I don't want to increase the weed seed bank, right? But you know what? Life sometimes intervenes and you increase your weed seed bank. It happens, all right? Doesn't mean I like it, it just means it happens and then you have to deal with it. Uh, but at least the mulch bought me the small window I had to get this, all right? So there's my win. I don't like this picture, I don't think it's success, except that I got that, all right? Sometimes you have to pick your battles and that's what I picked, yes? All right, so the orange flower at the end of the row, those are marigolds. Uh, one of the things, uh, I'm, I'm a bird of a feather with Mark Kui. I love using things that have a little bit of color to mark variety changes or rows. Uh, so I will use marigolds or zinnias or other things to mark when a variety changes. What you don't see in this picture real well uh, is there are actually more in this row because we were doing a cauliflower trial. So every 30 plants, there's actually a marigold. And that way I can walk it and say, okay, this is replication number one, two, three, four. Uh, it works very nicely, plus it's a flower. Uh, broccoli cauliflower don't care about the pollinators, but I do care about some of the habitat it might give to some predators, among other things. So I kind of like to do that. Uh, plus it makes me happier. You know, happy is good. We're kind of entering the period where we're supposed to have discussion, but I think we're continuing to have discussion as we go. Does that seem to fit what's going on? We've got, what, 20 minutes? Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to encourage you to keep asking me questions as we go, and it's perfectly fine with me. Obviously, I haven't come to a complete halt with a question, so we're good. All right, so here's a cultivation example. We've got onions here. There's four rows of onions in this bed. So my tractor wheels are out here and here. And I've got four rows of onions with drip tapes in between rows one and two and three and four. 
And this is just an example of where I don't use mulch because we've dialed in kind of how we like to control weeds for the most part here. And that's with that flex tying cultivator. But again, if I'm cultivating all of my crops, I can't do this. You can't get them all when your windows are small. So I've opted that this one, because we figured out a good cultivating tool that's in our arsenal works, we don't bother worrying about how are we going to mulch the onions. But I have seen people use all kinds of mulches for onions, including the uh, ground cloth has worked for some people well. I've seen plastic, I've seen paper. Uh, I don't know that I would recommend grass for onions because I think that mats down too much and it's going to probably promote some de disease issues with your onions. I don't know that any, has anybody done straw with onions in here? A little bit, what'd you think? <laughs> okay, so that was a fail. Yeah, I, I get it, I get it. Let's do this. Uh, living mulches is something some people were interested in. Uh, this is an example of some uh, bursine clover on September 23. Uh, I like bursine clover because once you mow it, it tends to stay roughly at that level. It doesn't tend to want to grow a whole lot taller after that first mow. The problem is, is if you scalp it, it tends to not grow. Okay, so you have to pick your height when you mow it very carefully, and then it tends to stay at that height. So if you're worried about putting something in between two rows of something, then something like a clover that tends to keep height. If you, if you look at a cover crop catalog like Albert Lee Seed, they will describe very well the culture of your cover crop. And some of them will say, when you cut it, it tends to stay at this height, it won't grow more. And their concern is, you want to grow it for maybe forage or something, and if you cut it too low, you're not gonna get the forage quality. In our case, we want it to stay low so I don't have to keep mowing it, right? So in some ways, something like bursim or maybe a New Zealand white clover might work. Word of caution, don't get them planted so close that their roots are in the root zone of your cash crop. Don't plant them in row. You are not going to like it. Uh, there was a study in 2015-16 uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison where they tried to do, they established the cover crop. I was a little bit annoyed with their choices. They chose uh, buckwheat for one of them. And it's like, you want a long-term living mulch, that's not buckwheat because buckwheat dies pretty early and goes to seed, unless you want it to keep reseeding, I suppose. All right, but what they found is they said, let's plant the whole field, and then we'll just dig holes for each of our plants, each of our broccolis, each of our peppers, and let them grow on that. You can take a wild guess what they learned. Yeah, the, the control where they didn't put any mulch produced normally. The stuff in the living mulch produced at about 25% because there was too much competition because you've made a weed. It's a nice weed, but you've made a weed. So I like living mulches, the idea of living mulches and trying to use them in paths, but I'm not sure I like them if they're in row. Now here's one of my favorite pictures. A farmer is happiest when he sees something like this, okay? Over here is sun hemp. In here is watermelons with a few zinnias in there to mark the different varieties. But of course, by this point, it didn't matter because the watermelons went where they wanted, right? Right here is buckwheat. Remember, I just disparaged buckwheat, but there it is. And then we have melons, zinnias, more melons, borage, more melons beyond that. Okay, so we've covered the entire field with something. All right? And they're things we can handle. Buckwheat, even if it goes to seed, that's the easiest weed in the world to deal with. So easy to kill if you want to kill it. And we timed this so that it was flowering when the melons and watermelons were flowering. Can you imagine the activity of pollinators in this thing? It was ridiculous. We actually reduced our planting of melon and watermelon plants and we tripled our production. Yeah, pretty nice, huh? This is the sun hemp. The sun hemp gets, got really tall. It got to about seven, eight feet tall. But the funny thing is, is the watermelons, we didn't plant it right next, by the way. It was not right next to the rows. But you know watermelons are going to grow where they're going to grow, right? They grew right on into the first two feet of the sun hemp and said, here, have a watermelon. 
that was nice and not nice because I didn't know they were there until I started mowing. <laughs> yeah. We, f we found these, though. We found a few. But it, it was kind of alarming to have this red stuff spewing out of the mower. I'm like, oh, no, what did I hit? You know, was that the worker we lost earlier this year? Oh, anyway. Oh, sorry. All right. Here's the high tunnel. Yes. Okay, for this particular year, the rows of watermelons and melons were just bare soil. So we cultivated up to a point until the canopy covered. So there was cultivation in this one. If I were to do this again next year, there would be paper mulch, the three-foot paper mulch to get them started. That would take care of my labor issues when everything's going on. The, the between-row stuff I would be able to cultivate with bigger things. And then by the time they started sprawling, they're, they're pretty much covering, canopying the area, and I should be fine. So, how, how I can't see how wide of a strip was here. Is it like three, four foot of watermelon? Yeah. I would say this is about six foot of watermelon right here. This is about four foot of buckwheat, because the, the camera does skew the, the angle here. We had about three foot of sun hemp over here. I just ran out of space. I wanted it to be four, but it was three. Uh, and then again, some of the same patterns. We've got four for melons. We've got one for the zinnias. Four again for melons. One for the borage. That kind of thing. Is that one row watermelon? This right here, that's a double row, two rows, 15-inch spacing, and it worked nicely. This was if I could do this every year. Uh, my problem was is when I went out to the pick, I wanted to sit down and just look at things, so I, I wasn't doing my work. It's like, oh, how nice, you know. The hard part was actually getting in and out to get the melons. I have no service access, so I have to walk in through. But you know, most of the vines are producing at the same time. They peak at the same time. So if you step on a few vines, you're not really hurting much of anything. I just had to get over it, you know, because you're so used to, uh, you know, don't want to do that. You just go in there, you get it, you get out, and everything's fine. That is one of my favorite pictures, though. Uh, here's the high tunnel. Somebody's bound to ask about what I do for weed control and high tunnel. Uh, I worry about it less because it's been so rainy. If you have people who are scheduled to come work, you have to have something for them to do. So you say, go weed in the high tunnel because it's too wet everywhere else, right? Which is an unfair answer. I get that. Okay. However, one thing that we have done, here's uh, tomatoes on. This thing's not working half the time. So we've got tomatoes on the two sides. Underneath, you'll notice the white flowers. That's sweet alyssum. So it was tomato, tomato, sweet alyssum, tomato, sweet, tomato, sweet alyssum. So every couple tomatoes, we put one in the ground in between. We didn't change our spacing of tomatoes. We just put the alyssum in. Next year, I think Tammy will agree with me, we'll plant, put them every other, between every plant. Because what the sweet alyssum does is it does a couple of things. It provides ground cover so that does tend to prevent some of the uh, evaporation of the moisture when you irrigate in the high tunnel, all right? It does not have a root zone that's the same as the tomato, so it's not competing for the same services. Okay, that's two. Three, it tends to attract hoverflies, which are an enemy of aphids. So if you've got aphid problems in the high tunnel, sweet alyssum might provide you with something. And then four, they smell nice and I like them. Sometimes that's a good enough reason. Okay, the spacing in this particular uh, high tunnel, uh, we're running spacing at a foot and a half for the tomatoes in here, and they're being stake and weave trellised. And we do a foot and a half partly because we want to make sure there's enough air circulation. I know some people run a foot, and I tend to like foot and a half. Sometimes the bigger tomatoes will go two. Okay, insider. Yep. The root zone for alyssum is typically like that. I mean, I pulled them out so easily at the end of the year, but the plants, you see how big they are. They tend to sprawl over the top, so I'm not too worried about the competition. And they're, they're actually doing me a service to prevent evaporation. So they're a good one. I, I might not do the same thing if it was, say, marigolds or basil or something else. And we've done some of those because they're going to compete more. Good questions, though. Uh, some things we've tried, we've tried straw in the high tunnel, we've tried paper in the high tunnel, we've tried grass mulch in the high tunnel. Uh, the alyssum I'm calling a living mulch, although it's kind of not quite a mulch, if you know what I mean. 
and I found the paper didn't break down, obviously, because it's not the same kind of environment. So I ended up having to take it out, which is exactly against what I wanted it to do. Uh, the straw mulch also didn't break down because it's not as moist in there. So once again, I had to take it out. And, you know, the grass mulch actually did break down. So if I were to do one of these, I might try grass mulch because this is high rent real estate, right? And being high rent real estate, if you don't have the labor to do the weeding in here, you still need to suppress the weeds. Maybe the grass mulch is the way to go because you don't have to remove it. You can incorporate it easier in the soil than you can paper that hasn't broken down or straw that hasn't broken down. Makes some sense, right? We're running in a few minutes. We still got a little time. We're doing great. Let me bring this one up. Um, in the East Coast, there's a really interesting idea I would like to try. Remember I said there was the using the residue of a cover crop as a mulch that we haven't done? What they do is they establish hairy vetch in the fall, they let it grow out, they let it start again in the spring, and then they cut it. Yes? We've put a few in the field, yes. Uh, probably not a good question for me to answer because our field tomatoes pretty much croaked this year. But I would say it'd probably be just about as good. Yeah. But in any event, uh, the hairy vetch thing, what they do is they cut it down in the spring. They, they can't really roller crimp it because it's too flexible, I guess. But they cut it, they let it lay, and then they plant the tomatoes directly into the residue. And the residue is your mulch for the season. And hairy vetch is a legume, so it's going to be a slow-release nitrogen. And it seems to do a good job of reducing some of the diseases the tomatoes are having on the East Coast. It maintains soil moisture, and it provides that mulch. So it seems like a win, but I think, Mark, would you agree that hairy vetch establishment and having it come back in the spring is dicey in Iowa? Yeah? Yeah, so three years out of five, maybe it would work. So I wouldn't put all my bank on it, but I think I'd like to maybe try this. Maybe a frost seeding? Yeah, so maybe. So if anybody wants to try something different, we do have a cooperative program at PFI, and folks like you who are curious would be good folks to get involved in cooperators, and maybe there would be a project having to deal with hairy vetch and tomatoes that you could be involved in. How's that for a plug, PFI? We can go with this. Anyway, uh, this is also one of my favorite photos. I would like to thank you all for bothering to listen to me because I know you're all thinking about weather and getting home and I want you all to drive really safe because I want to see you again. Thank you for listening. Do you have one more question? I think we got time for one. Yeah. Okay, so the question, and I see I've got five minutes, so we might be able to do a couple more if people want, but uh, the question is, is do I find I have enough of the grass to actually do the grass mulching that I want to do? And the answer is no. And during a year that wouldn't be so wet, I would not have enough by a long ways. So I admit that. However, it's the years when we're so wet that I actually need that grass mulch most. So what would happen is I would prioritize, let's say we have an average year, whatever that is now, all right? If we have an average year, I would expect it to start wet and get drier progressively throughout the season, right? So that means my grass growth is going to peter out as the season goes on. Well, you know what? That's actually fine because the crops that I would like to target most with the grass mulch might be something like the green beans and the kale because I saw the most success and use out of them there. Well, an early kale planting, green beans, May 15 to June 15, that's when the grass is still going pretty well it matches up well. So prioritize where it goes and I think you're happy. If you think you're going to do everything in grass mulch, you're going to be unhappy. So it's a good question though. And we, we have thought about it and I begin thinking I should go rent a couple city lots and grow them the way I want to and get the mulch off there. Uh, but maybe not. Yeah, the, okay, there's a good one. There's a mention about weed seed. If you're going to mow anything 
and spread it as a mulch, just like that straw mulch, you will introduce weeds. Okay, there will be grass seed, and if you are, don't have a perfect, the perfect lawn that you would mow for a, a baseball diamond, for example, which I wouldn't want to use because of the chemicals, but you get on my point, right? You're going to introduce weed seeds. But once again, these are things I think I can handle with what I have. For the benefit, I'm willing to introduce those weed seeds versus the benefit I think I'm getting from them. So, but keep your eyes open. You will introduce weeds. Yeah. Yeah, so by the way, if you don't know, uh, Tammy Fox works at the Genuine Fox Farm where I work. Um, and so she's been able to observe a few things as well. And yeah, we've noticed that the, the conditions of the soil underneath the grass mulch have been much more positive for invertebrates. So we kind of like it for that reason. Yeah, the great, this is a great question and a point, too. The mold issue, when, when you have a mulch breaking down, you're going to create good environment for molds or other kinds of fungi. Uh, the answer to that question is, believe it or not, this year we didn't have anything that caused problems in the crop. Now, if you put your hand underneath after it's been breaking down for a while and flip it over, you will find some of that. But my argument for that is these are healthy environmental fungi that are doing their job. If you start seeing a problem up in the stems of, say, the beans, you know, sometimes you can get some of those fungus problems, then maybe it would be a good time to pull some stuff away to give it a little more air circulation. What about the grass being right along the stem of the plant? All right, so the question is mulch right next to the stem of the plant, yeah. And the, it, does that cause damage? And the answer is, is the time that I'm most concerned about potential damage is when you've just cut the grass and when it's at its hottest. So sometimes what we've done is we've spread a little bit away from the plant and then we'll come back and knock it in. But once it's gotten past that initial breakdown period where it gets real hot, it's usually fine. Good question. <laughs> Next question is, is the grass slippery to walk on? Uh, these are all great questions because, it, you know, it affects you. And the answer is, is we didn't, did you ever have a problem walking on it? I actually kind of liked it, yeah. frankly. So I didn't have problems with slipping on it. Okay. Yes. What of the grass mulch yeah, uh, once again, we were shooting for four to six inches. But again, I, I still think the best rule of thumb is if you walk over it, you scuff the soil and you don't immediately see soil, you probably have it thick enough. Uh, and it's going to depend on how how wet it was when you cut it too because it's going to pack more so i'd say if you feel like it's staying covered when you walk on it it's all good and you know what if you get it wrong you'll know because stuff is going to pop up through it yeah all right we got time for one right so right here There you go. And as the stuff that you have CFA, uh, that the CFA plants are having the same problems. And, and those of us who do those these sorts of things are quite happy to cooperate with our workers. So there you go. chance for a side business, business right there, collecting a grass mulch from your CSA members and bringing it and spreading it. I might actually pay somebody to do that. There we go. Thank you so much for listening. Drive safely.